All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we are here today to talk about uh, e-cigarette disposal dis collection and disposal in schools. And we're so excited to be joined by Kira Hall and Terry Rosie um, um, for today's presentation. So before we get started, I have just a couple of few housekeeping slides um, just to get everybody up to speed. So this um, next slide will, if you haven't been on a Zoom webinar yet before, just quickly an overview of what a Zoom webinar looks like. By default, you all are muted, but you can use the chat box to interact with us, um, which is the next then icon over. Um, you can also use the Q&A box to ask a question during um, the presentation. We'll be saving all of the questions until the end of the webinar. And then from there, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, but make sure to put your questions in there. So that way it doesn't get lost in any commentary that comes through um, throughout the webinar as people are sharing their opinions and their thoughts um, and anything that they specifically have to add. Um, and then quickly, we just want to remind you that our National Leadership Forum is coming up January 31st to February 3rd, and we're excited to welcome everyone back to the Gaylord National Harbor in Maryland for four days of training and networking. Our early bird registration deadline is December 13th, so if you'd like more information on the week, you can visit cadca.org slash forum 2022. Um, and you'll be able to see all of the information that we have shared so far about what we're expecting um, for the week and the week to look like. The recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint of the slides will be made available on our website in the days following. So you'll be able to share this recording with those who weren't able to join. Um, and additionally, once you complete the evaluation, you'll be able to download a um, letter of participation with ours if that is something that you would like. Um, and that will be available after completing the evaluation. You'll need to download it directly from there. But from there, you'll be able to get it. And now that students have returned to in-person learning, schools are saddled with um, the responsibility of properly managing and disposing of e-cigarette products. And we know that's no easy burden. And some schools have started to ask if vape drop boxes have a role to play in addressing the e-cigarette epidemic. So this webinar will discuss the hazardous waste status of e-cigarettes and the potential dangers of vape drop boxes, as well as highlight some of the local and state efforts being pursued in Colorado, Utah, and California, and then to discuss best practices that schools and other public entities can adopt to handle and regulate these products. So GIA, um, our Geographic Health Equity Alliance, is a CDC-funded national network dedicated to reducing the health disparities related to tobacco and cancer. And GIA's focus is on reducing geographic health disparities, which they define as differences in health behaviors, outcomes, and policies related to where people live, work, and play. And so if you'd like more information about GIA and promoting health equity, you can visit geohealthequity.org. Um, and to introduce today's presenters, so Kira Hill is a staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center. Kira provides legal technical assistance to public health professionals and advocates working on commercial tobacco control policies in California and throughout the United States. As part of the center's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> As part of the center's FDA project, uh, she also closely monitors the federal regulation of tobacco products and works with state, tribal, and national public health experts to identify opportunities to strengthen federal tobacco regulation. She also leads the center's work on developing and uh, researching environmental policies relating to commercial tobacco product pollution and tobacco product waste. Kira received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University and her JD um, from Lewis and Clark Law School. And Terry Rusi is a youth tobacco policy specialist at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and has worked on tobacco policy for Colorado since 2015. Currently, his work focuses on youth tobacco policies that address access to tobacco and illegal tobacco sales to youth. Prior to working for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, he worked for the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division of Colorado Health and Human Services Department as a regional alcohol, tobacco, and drug prevention specialist. Terry received his Master of Public Health degree from Walden University. And so, Kira, I will turn it over to you for the rest of the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Brittany. Um, so with that, um, yeah, hi everyone. It looks like we have people from all over the country. I didn't see any international attendees, but I'm sure you're out there. Um, 
Thanks so much for joining us today for the webinar entitled e-cigarette collection and disposal in schools, ABCs, and FAQs. A lot of what we're going to talk about and specifically what I'm going to talk about will go beyond um, e-cigarettes in schools, but we will spend some time talking about the role of schools in both prevention and management of e-cigarettes. So I want to start off with a poll just to get a sense of where you all are coming from. Um, hopefully it pops up. It looks like it popped up in the Zoom window, um, but I also have the questions on this slide. So please just select the statement that best describes where you work. Do you work at a school? Do you work at a tobacco control program? What about just generally in health policy? Do you work for an NGO or a nonprofit? Do you work for the federal government? Or maybe you're in some other area of work that I have not captured in this list. So uh, please select all that apply just so we can get a sense of where folks are coming from. And I'll give you all a minute to fill that out. Great. So let's see. It sounds like most folks work for nonprofits. Um, we have about a third of people who work in tobacco control, 10% at school. That's that's pretty good. Um, and looks like maybe we uh, we have a lot of people kind of in health policy um, and a couple for, from the federal government. So great, that's really helpful. I think it's just useful for us to know where you all are coming from, um, kind of what your interests are in, in learning about this stuff. So awesome, thank you very much for, for filling that out. Um, all right, so um, before I dive into the kind of substance of what we're here to talk about, I wanna just provide a little bit more background information. So first of all, as was mentioned in the introduction, I work at the Public Health Law Center. My name is Kira Hill. We are located at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I just wanna acknowledge that we are located on the indigenous homelands of the Dakota people, also known as, as the Sioux Nation, and that four federally recognized Dakota tribal nations remain in the area. The region is also shared a territory with the Anishinaabe, also known as the Ojibwe or Chippewa. And the Ho-Chunk Nation also has a historic relationship to the region. We appreciate the ongoing stewardship spiritual connections and life ways developed in these homelands upon which the law school sits. And relatedly, I do also wanna acknowledge the difference between traditional and commercial tobacco. Um, so throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be referring to the environmental impacts of tobacco, but I wanna clarify that I'm talking specifically about industrial scale commercial tobacco production. I am not talking about traditional tobacco as it is still used religiously, medicinally, and ceremoniously in many different cultures. And I also do want to just point out that the Public Health Law Center offers free legal technical assistance to communities, public health advocates, and other partners. We also publish on important issues pertaining to commercial tobacco control, and we offer trainings and webinars. We do not offer direct legal representation, though, and we do not lobby. And our goal at the Public Health Law Center is policy that improves the public health. This means taking into account the social determinants of health, adverse childhood experiences, and inequity in general. We consider it our responsibility to use our legal knowledge to bring justice to public health as we support our partners in reducing health disparities. When all people are healthier, the communities they live in are happier, safer, safer more vibrant places. So what are we here to talk about today? So even though we're here primarily to talk about e-cigarette disposal in schools, I think it's really important context to understand tobacco products pollution generally. So I'm gonna spend some time doing that. Um, and in, in doing that, I wanna highlight three major categories of tobacco product pollution. These are plastic waste, e-cigarette and hazardous waste, and environmental justice, or more accurately, environmental injustice. So first of all, I just want to remind everyone that every step of the tobacco product life cycle involves both health, health equity and environmental justice concerns. This includes the upstream aspects of the tobacco product life cycle, so specifically the cultivation or growing stage of tobacco product production, 
the curing or drying stage, and the manufacturing stage. So the impacts from growing, curing, and manufacturing tobacco include deforestation, pesticide overuse and contamination, child labor, food and water insecurity, climate change, and mismanaged industrial waste. So just to remind you of the scale and seriousness of this problem, when we talk about deforestation, we're talking about billions of trees that are raised and burned every year. And when we're talking about child labor, we're talking about children who are exposed to toxic levels of pesticides and nicotine poisoning from handling tobacco leaves, often without proper protective equipment or adequate training. And then tobacco products manufacturing also produces industrial waste. A 2015 World Health uh, Organization bulletin estimated that in 1995 alone, tobacco manufacturing resulted in the production of more than 2 million metric tons of solid waste 300,000 metric tons of nicotine containing waste and 200,000 metric tons of chemical waste with toxic byproducts such as ammonia and hydrochloric acid. The manufacturing stage of tobacco production is also responsible for an output of nearly 9 billion liters of wastewater annually. And in the United States specifically, the, toxic re the toxics release inventory, which is a inventory compiled by the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA, reported that in 2016, 32 US-based tobacco facilities released almost 2 million pounds of toxic chemical waste. 1.2 million of those pounds was released into the air. And 89% of those chemicals, um, well, 89% of those chemicals were released into the air. And then the top three chemicals released at those sites were nicotine and nicotine salts, nitrine, nitrate compounds, and ammonia. So in addition to the CO2 emissions from growing and uh, curing tobacco that I just discussed on the earlier slide, there are also additional greenhouse gas emissions from the manufacturing process. And then the environmental impacts of the tobacco life cycle don't end with manufacturing, as you can imagine. They include additional greenhouse gas emissions and waste resulting from transportation. They include second and third hand smoke resulting from consumption of cigarettes and other tobacco products. And finally, they include the many impacts of tobacco product waste, which is what I'm gonna spend most of my time on. So there are still a lot of folks out there who don't quite understand the connection between single plastic, single use plastic and tobacco products. And there's a pretty significant connection. And that's primarily that cigarette filters are made of plastic. So studies show that many people, both smokers and non-smokers alike, believe that filters are biodegradable but the truth is that they're not. They break apart over a matter of decades into tens of thousands of strands of microplastics that persist in the environment and end up in our water and our food and even in marine animals like the sea turtle depicted on this slide. There are some recent studies um, on microplastics that have found that the reproductive life cycles of certain marine organisms are actually impacted by the presence of cigarette butt microplastics in the environment. Um, which is pretty shocking. And then there are also some studies on microplastics that have impacts on humans, though those studies um, don't really differentiate between the sources of microplastics. And so the sources include many types of microplastics other than cigarette butts. But, you know, generally speaking, cigarette butts are the most littered item in the world on a per item basis. And then they're most, they're most consistently found item in beach cleanups as well. Um, and in the, in the study that I have on this slide, the most commonly found microplastics in the bodies of every sea turtle that was tested was not from straws or water bottles, which are kind of the things that most people think of when they think of single use plastics. Rather, they were from cigarette filters and tires. And then we can kind of deduce from that that e-cigarette cartridges and casings around the batteries, which are made of plastic, um, we know that they also end up on the ground. They often leach nicotine, which I'll get into on the next slide. Um, and then as they're stepped on and run over, they also break apart into little pieces of plastic. And then other forms of tobacco product packaging, including cigar wrappers, tips, and pouches are similarly made of plastic and they end up on the ground and they eventually make their way into waterways. So many of these plastics, including cigarette butts, uh, also contain thousands of chemicals that leach into the ground and water and eventually into the air long after they're thrown away. So um, the primary thing that we're here to talk about today are e-cigarettes. And I really wanna just establish at the outside or at the outset that most e-cigarettes are classified as hazardous waste under federal law. So this is because nicotine, 
is listed as an acute hazardous waste under the Federal Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which is often referred to as RICRA. So nicotine was first listed in the 1980s when it was used as a pesticide. But since then, and since e-cigarettes e have come on the market, the EPA has been really clear that e-cigarettes are still acute hazardous waste, considering that there's no evidence that the chemical has changed and it's still extremely toxic to humans, even in low doses. And then even aside from the nicotine, lithium ion batteries are themselves classified as hazardous waste in many places. And then some other batteries are also considered hazardous waste in states like California. So batteries run the risk of exploding and e-cigarette batteries have caused serious injury and pose a fire risk. The more we learn about metals and other chemicals in e-cigarettes, there may also be other reasons to list e-cigarettes as hazardous waste due just alone to their toxicity. But generally speaking, because of one, the nicotine and two, the batteries in e-cigarettes, they are classified as hazardous waste when they are discarded or intended to be discarded. Um, and then just going back to kind of toxicity generally, we also have some studies with more and more co coming out every year showing that cigarette butts themselves meet certain thresholds for toxicity and that they leach metals and heavy metals and then they emit volatile organic compounds, much like pesticides, which include nicotine or paint, and then polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are emitted by fossil fuel derived products like coal, tar, pitch, and asphalt, um, among any other, many other things. So we have studies that show that these chemicals leach from cigarette butts and that they can kill fish, they can inhibit plant growth, and they can even negatively impact the mating behavior of marine organisms. And as I mentioned before, these chemicals continue to leach from microplastic fibers. So even when the butt or the other kind of plastic has broken apart into tiny pieces, the problem, has, the problem continues. Um, I'd say the scientific community has a pretty good idea at this point how toxic this stuff is even long after it's used, it's just a matter of convincing the public and ultimately policymakers that it matters. Um, and then kind of just plain old experience backed up by research tells us that all of this toxic plastic waste is most concentrated around where tobacco products are sold and consumed, which we know is itself concentrated as a result of decades of intentional predatory industry practice in communities of color and low-income communities. So this image on this slide shows the density of tobacco retailers in San Francisco, which ultimately adopted an ordinance restricting density of tobacco retailers, not on a citywide basis, which other jurisdictions have done, but on a smaller scale um, in order to begin to address the clear disparity in where tobacco products were being sold. And importantly, the disproportionate retailer density is compounded by the fact that fewer government resources are expended to clean up waste in communities of color and in low-income communities. So this means as, a tobacco, as tobacco product waste accumulates, it doesn't get picked up as quickly in those communities as it does in wealthier, wider communities. And on top of that, when the waste gets picked up in those wealthier, wider communities, it's more often than not brought to a landfill or an incinerator that's more likely to be located in or near one of the communities that's already experiencing a disproportionate amount of pollution from multiple sources, including tobacco product waste. So this means that disproportionate retailer density creates bigger problems with respect to exposure to pollution beyond that, that stems from the presence of tobacco product waste itself. And if this kind of sounds really disturbingly familiar, that's because it is. Um, in fact, it's another manifestation of the same racist practices that gave rise to the environmental justice movement of the 1980s. So this image depicts a report put out by the United Church of Christ's Commission for Racial Justice in 1987, which coined the term environmental racism and demonstrated that race, more than any other factor, determined where polluting industries and hazardous waste sites were likely to be located. And that's a reality that continues to this day. And I hope that I've convinced you that the tobacco industry is itself a polluting industry, meaning that it should be dealt with in much the same way as other polluting industries are treated. So this requires a policymaking approach that takes into account the principles of environmental justice, which at bottom means that all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, are meaningfully involved in the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So this, and these 
types of policies include policies that affect where and how tobacco products are sold, consumed, and discarded. So at the end of the day, uh, tobacco retail density is an environmental justice issue, and tobacco product waste is an environmental justice issue. So this means that if we need that we need environmental justice oriented approaches that involve and prioritize the communities that have been and continue to be most harmed by the sale of commercial tobacco products. And it also means we need to direct resources to those communities in order to right the decades of wrongs. Um, so at the Public Health Law Center, we do have some example model tobacco retailer policies that incorporate sort of general density and proximity restrictions, but it's worth again, kind of drawing attention to the San Francisco model that limits the location of retailers based on why on where they're congregated in a jurisdiction, rather than addressing the problem on a jurisdiction wide or per capita basis. So this image on the slide is pretty small, but you can generally see that attrition of retailers between 2014 and 2016, which is represented by the green dots, occurred at a greater amount in the areas where retailers were most densely congregated, um, which is the red dots, as a result of San Francisco's, uh, so the number of retailers reduced most in the areas where the density had been greatest before the policy was adopted. Um, and then relatedly, limiting proximity of retailers to each other has been shown to reduce overall retailer density as well. Um, and I'll explain in a little bit more detail why I'm talking about policy options, but I do want to just talk, talk, another, talk about another policy option that's worth discussing, and that um, is just simply a sales restriction. So, just like many jurisdictions all over the country are adopting prohibitions on the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes and flavored e-cigarettes, prohibiting the sale of filtered cigarettes, um, which California, for example, has been trying to do for years, is likely the best place to start. So logically, this could also include things like small cigars with plastic tips and packaging that's not recyclable and that's often discarded as with packaging that's now used on cheap flavored cigars as well. And as you may know, cigarette filters do not improve the safety or health of tobacco products. Um, in fact, there are reports from the Surgeon General that have found that filters make cigarettes more dangerous by enabling smokers to inhale more vigorously. And then they also encourage this perception from smokers that they're safer. But that was really the original rationale for filters from the tobacco companies in the first place. The idea was not actually to make them safer, it was only to make them appear safer. So the added benefit of, sale, of a sales restriction approach um, is that it effectively achieves what the end game hopes to achieve, only using different reasoning and rationale. So by affecting demand, it would have impacts on production and consumption of the products. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term end game, um, it generally just refers to the goal of ending the tobacco epidemic, which um, includes policies that impact the presence and availability of products uh, by reducing demand and consumption. But there are, as I mentioned earlier, real concerns about electronic products from an environmental standpoint. So particularly so-called disposable products, which many of you are probably all too familiar with. Um, and the, these products contain e-waste and a battery that will never be recharged or recycled and along with the nicotine. And since they're marketed as disposable or daily e-cigarettes, a user will presumably be tossing several hundred of these a year. And that allows toxic nicotine and other dangerous substances to leach into the environment. So local authorities can look at prohibiting the sale of disposable e-cigarettes just as they would filter in cigarettes. And then similarly, cartridges or pods could be included in a sales restriction. Um, pods are generally not designed to be reusable themselves, though, of course, you can find teenagers on YouTube sh showing that they can be refilled, not recommended. <laughs> um, these products end up littered around school parking lots and parks, anywhere young folks who are using these products congregate. Um, and we know, as I mentioned before, that they're full of toxic remnants and unused nicotine even after they're used. And then, as you may know, given that you're attending this webinar, um, the accumulation of these liquid nicotine products, cartridges and pods, makes for a lose-lose situation for many public entities like schools and even courts and TSA at airports, so anywhere these things get confiscated. A sales restriction um, that would prevent these from getting into the hands of young people would ultimately have a large positive impact, both on public health and on the financial risk that's being imposed on entities like schools by the youth vaping epidemic. So this image on the slide that I have is actually from Boulder County, Colorado's Vape Aware campaign, 
which provides middle and high schools with vape disposal kits and guidance for how to correctly deal with these products. Um, Terry is going to be talking about that in a lot more detail shortly, though, so just stay tuned and we'll, we'll get into that in more detail. There are also a few examples of laws that have attempted to curb the sale of these products on a statewide level. So this image is from New York State Tobacco Product Waste Reduction Act, which would ban outright the sale of cigarettes with single-use filters and single-use e-cigarettes by 2023. Um, a bill has also been introduced during the past couple of sessions in California, which would have the effect of um, ideally doing something similar. Unfortunately, I don't know of any jurisdictions that have adopted a sales restriction kind of based on the environmental impacts of these products alone, but jurisdictions in California, including Beverly Hills and Manhattan Beach, have restricted the sale of tobacco products entirely with very limited exceptions. And then the city of Santa Cruz has adopted a resolution um, or did adopt a resolution last April that calls on the city council to consider policy approaches that would specifically tackle tobacco product waste in the community. And then getting back to the hazardous waste nature of e-cigarettes, um, it might also be possible to include nicotine as a hazardous material, requiring increased transparency and data sharing, even at the local or state level. So often what are called hazmat or hazardous materials laws um, already ex exist at the state and local level, but they tend to exempt finished consumer products or smaller amounts of hazardous products like e-cigarettes or liquid nicotine. But local jurisdictions, depending on the state regulations, could designate nicotine-containing consumer products as hazardous materials. The benefit of this approach uh, would ultimately be that it would help identify hazardous situations, so large amounts of hazardous waste on hand, large amounts of e-cigarettes being held, um, and it would require clear disclosure of how much hazardous material is on site, what kind of material it is, its characteristics, require reporting of any issues, um, are things being stored correctly, where are they be being stored, what is the plan for if there's some sort of fire or spill. Um, and it would importantly also require posting of a placard that would give adequate warning to the public and to emergency responders of what the hazardous material is, um, and, and kind of like how they should be responding to something if it happens. So fines could be imposed for failing to com comply and then facilities would be required to get a certificate, a certificate of compliance annually. And then kind of ultimately having a sign outside of vape shop warning of an inhalation hazard and of the hazardous waste nature of these products might also impact consumer behavior because it would promote understanding um, and just provide the consumers with more information about um, what, what they're using than they currently have. So let's turn to some options available at the school level. Um, as I mentioned, Harry is going to be addressing Boulder County, Colorado and some other um, Colorado specific efforts to develop a safe and legal way of, of collecting and disposing of products. So there are some other examples we've heard of. Um, and one is that there are a few schools that have asked about providing disposal boxes for students that would be anonymous. Um, there's a, a picture on this slide of one example, but I do want to just um, provide some caveats about this type of system. So first, safety is a concern when students are just dropping off vapes non anonymously into these containers because it's not all that uncommon for these items to leak which as we talked about earlier, is really bad for anyone handling these items when they're being collected, especially if this, the person collecting them is not wearing gloves. And then the batteries can be unstable, corroded, or even kind of like bulging. And when combined with a heating element, like they are with an e-cigarette, uh, they can explode and cause fires. In fact, um, this, these are some quotes from FEMA, or more specifically the US Fire Administration part of FEMA. And they have said that e-cigarettes pose a quote, new and unique hazard, and that there's no analogy among com consumer products to the risk for severe acute injury presented by e-cigarettes. And they even go so far as to call them flaming rockets, or their products that behave like flaming, flaming rockets when a battery fails. So if no one's monitoring um, where, which items are going into vape drop boxes, how they're being collected, um, 
there's no there's no preventing any other types of items from going into the box as well. These items could pose a really serious risk of fire or explosion. And then for the same reason that um, is are listed on this slide, the FAA, um, the Federal Aviation Administration, actually prohibits e-cigarettes from checked luggage. There's an image on the slide from that kind of warning. Um, and then thirdly, once a certain amount of hazardous waste is collected under federal law, it needs to be taken to an appropriate disposal site within a certain amount of time, and it needs to be handled appropriately. Um, that amount of time is often between 30 and 90 days. So if these items are sitting for months on end, they pose both the safety risk and the run the risk of violating federal and state law. So these issues um, pertaining to exactly what certain jurisdictions need to do under their state and federal laws, um, the, 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 these issues are really complicated and there are some resources that are already out there. So Terry's gonna talk about Colorado's um, guidance and um, county and local level efforts in a lot more detail. But I do also just wanna share Utah's Department of Environmental Quality, Waste Management and Radiation Control, that's the name of their, their environmental department. Um, they also just came out with a guidance document for schools that goes into a fair amount of detail about the proper way to handle these products. Um, and once you sort of check out the, the guidance, I have a link on the last slide. Um, it might seem like overkill, uh, especially for, for folks who would rather just throw this stuff in the trash. But the reality is that these things do leak, they do catch on fire, they injure people. And so schools really do have an interest in ensuring that their students and staff are safe. And then as for other resources, um, the Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products has a page on the explosion and fire risk that e-cigarettes pose, as well as a page on safe handling and disposal of e-cigarettes. So two of the suggestions that FDA makes do seem to raise some red flags with respect to the anonymous vape drop box um, example on the earlier slide. For example, they say batteries should be stored in a cool temperature controlled environment they should be labeled as hazardous waste and they shouldn't be stored with other metal objects or with other batteries. And then FDA's page also notes that poison control centers receive thousands of calls per year due to accidental exposure to nicotine e-liquids. And they also highlight that these products need to be handled extremely carefully by anyone dealing with them. I've certainly heard anecdotal evidence of folks who have collected these products and then actually felt, um, if, if they've gotten nicotine on their hands, they've actually felt the effects of that. Um, and then the FDA's page also cites to PHLC's resources. Um, that's Public Health Law Center, the organization that I work for. Um, we have some resources on this issue. And then there are also some other resources about specific time constraints that apply to holding onto these products under federal law, um, labeling requirements, transporting and handling requirements. Um, and that, that may or may not apply depending on the amount of product that's being collected for disposal. Um, so I'll provide some link there. This slide does provide some links to some of the resources I've talked about, along with some additional links. Um, so as I just mentioned, we at the Public Health Law Center have a general FAQ document on school disposal of e-cigarettes, and that's excerpted on um, this page. Uh, and then I also have a link to FDA's best practices webpage. As I mentioned, Colorado has state-specific guidance that Terry is going to go into in more detail. Um, and then EPA is working on this issue and um, we've heard that they have a resource to help schools sort through these things that they'll be coming out with, although we don't know exactly when that's gonna be coming out. So if you have connections with, with EPA and wanna uh, knock on, on their door about get, coming out with that guidance, I think it would be really helpful as well. So um, this is the my, contact information um, or the Public Health Law Center's contact information. And then, um, yeah, we will take Q&A at the end. So in the meantime, I will pass this off to Terry. Thank you, Kira. Thank you guys so much. Uh, um, no matter how many times I have the opportunity to talk about uh, this subject, it really, I just get excited about the potential of this work. Um, I, got, I got involved in sort of thinking about the impact of electronic uh, tobacco products 
I guess back in uh, 2016, one of our local communities, and uh, we're, we're going to highlight Boulder today, um, one of our local communities had been receiving uh, lots of calls from uh, one of their high schools and really was trying to figure out how do, how do we respond, you know, to this uh, 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 collection of, of these products. And so, so that's really 2016, that was really sort of uh, uh, the beginning of that for Colorado. And what we d discovered really was that what we're facing really is a very serious issue here. Uh, trying to understand what do we do with you know tobacco product waste. Now I'm going to say tobacco product waste, and I mean it as general as as what you're thinking, but I also mean it specifically for electronic products. So uh, I may use those terms interchangeably here. But you know, we were really trying to figure out what do we do with all of these tobacco product waste that both that are collected. Uh, that are being confiscated and really just littered uh, across the state. And, you know, we were, we started to really think about where, where are these items collected? And, you know, we, we understood that uh, from the school perspective that they were really sitting in the desk of school personnel, or you could walk out into the parking lot uh, and uh, see, uh, you know, any, any number of these products there. But you could also walk into your uh, neighborhood park or near, playgrounds or just really lining the streets of, of a community, right? Uh, what we know is that youth tobacco use comes at a cost not only to just our health, like youth health, but it also uh, has an impact on the environment as well. And Kira mentioned this, you know, that nicotine is considered a acute hazardous waste. And if you think about what that means, it's, it's on the uh, EPA's highest level of risk list, if you will, meaning acute hazard to potentially uh, cause disease or death. We know that uh, these products have uh, ion batteries that really just power e-cigarettes and they require a specialized disposal process uh, E-cigarettes are made of plastic and electronics, and all of these items really at a minimum should be recycled. But schools really are a critical avenue uh, for addressing this issue head on. And, and often we really see the problem sort of start, become identified at, in or out of school. And what I also know from doing this work for a while is that schools really are the first to find the solution. Uh, this is such a beautiful picture. I just want to take a moment to absorb this, man. This is uh, really anywhere in the mountains, Colorado. Uh, you can just see these beautiful areas here. So sorry for that little side note there. But the next slide, really want to talk about sort of at a, at a state level. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some information about what we've done at the state and then we're gonna really drill down into what our local communities have done and then even drill further into what the schools uh, in partnership with our tobacco programs have done as well. So, so because of that work in 2016, or at least uh, the problem being identified by one of our local public health agencies and, and the school district in Boulder uh, County, um, I, I reached out to our environmental health group, specifically our hazardous waste unit, and we really sit down and we said, what does the EPA say? What are some best practices related to uh, the disposal of nicotine in general uh, products for, and we wanted to give some guidance for both businesses, government agencies, and schools as well. And this this document was a labor of love, I guess, for a couple of years. Um, and, and the timing of this being published really coincided with an EPA ruling on nicotine patch disposal. So they, they came back and they re-looked at how healthcare facilities had to dispose of nicotine patches. So some of the key points uh, that we came up in this, in this document, and because I've worked with the environmental, the uh, hazardous waste unit, 
much of this work uh, was pretty technical piece, but um, so we talk in, about in this document about uh, discarding vaping liquids may present a risk to human health. We talk about um, uh, uh, about handling how to handle these uh, products and what type of regulations uh, that, that are required from a state of Colorado hazardous materials uh, perspective. We talk about what nicotine containing waste products, what, what products are actually regulated. We talk about a, uh, a, an item um, that can really get a little complicated uh, about being a certain type of generator if you collect a certain amount of these products. This document also provides guidance on how to dispose of, how to ship, and how to record the collection of these materials. And then lastly, uh, we give some recommendations about how, how and what to do with non-nicotine uh, uh, waste that you uh, may collect. Uh, so what we're seeing now is, um, you know, uh, nicotine free or, uh, you know, those types of products. And so we give some general guidance uh, related to that. And so on the next slide, because this, because this was really technical uh, and was going to be difficult to explain uh, when we began to talk to schools about this issue, we felt like it was really important to, to you know, work with our Department of Education, work with a few superintendents from uh, some of our larger school districts. We uh, have a uh, technical assistance provider who in our tobacco program works directly and specifically on tobacco-free school policies. So we really took this to them and said, we need to talk about this issue in the schools. We need to marry this idea of these interesting regulations and complex regulations at a federal and state level. So how do we do that? And so we came up with uh, this uh, guidance document specifically for schools, but with the foundation in that original guidance document. In this document, we go through, you know, a lot of the same things about, you know, how to store or collect uh, these devices, uh, how to label, uh, the, if you store these materials, how you need to label them, what type of storage uh, containers uh, are appropriate or approved. We give them some tips about make sure that you keep your storage limits to less than 2.2 pounds because that's really, without going into a lot of detail, that's really where you start to cross that line uh, to become a different type of generator of a hazardous waste. And so uh, you, you're uh, subject to a lot more regulation, a lot more monies involved uh, as well. In this document, we also talk about, you know, how to transport these materials. But I think what really from this document we really tried to do is to make this as plain language as, as a state document can be, make these as, as, as plain language as possible, saying things like never place nicotine containing waste into a normal trash can. Also saying things like the use of electronic nicotine products is a serious health concern and a disruption to learning. Um, you know, we talk about the proper disposal of confiscated devices uh, and, and ways to keep your school safe. So we really tried to make that connection back to them. And then, and then the, you know, another major point of this was that waste containing any concentration of nicotine is considered hazardous. So, can, so as you can imagine, uh, you know, trying to launch even a, you know, a more plain language document like this uh, into a very fast paced uh, school district where the superintendent or the school principal, um, you know, may not have a lot of time to, you know, dive deeply into these types of issues. We wanted to really draw on, you know, what are the most important items that if only for a few moments uh, they could see. Um, again, in this document, we give sort of some of the examples of what that might 
uh, what types of products might look like. We've connected this document to a broader youth vaping um, a letter that goes out from the Colorado Depart or, yeah, the Department of Education. Um, the other piece, and we're going to get into some specifics from Boulder County here, uh, that we tried to do is create an FAQ for uh, that tries to address as many of, of the questions that might come up at a school level, like at the district level, um, and, and, and provide those uh, at a quick glance for uh, anybody who's reading this. Uh, you know, there's some pretty, you know, uh, strong language in here about, you know, hazardous waste and keeping your school safe and, you know, what to do uh, about uh, about these products. So uh, I felt like providing some quick, easy guidance, uh, answers to some questions uh, would be important. So some of the questions uh, that we uh, ask and answer in here is simply, where can I get a storage container? What should I do with non-nicotine containing e-liquids uh, or cigarettes? Uh, and uh, we actually say any device you collect regardless of whether you can tell it has nicotine or not, should be con considered a potential hazardous waste and safely disposed of and stored in this way, in, in, a, in a proper way. I think one of the questions that came up uh, as we were sort of vetting this document was, who pays for the cost of storage and disposal, right? And that's a big issue, right? So if I live in a school district that's not close, uh, doesn't have a strong partnership with their like uh, a local public health agency who may or may not have funding to support a program like this, or their environmental services division doesn't have really the finances to support this, who, who pays for this? So uh, we give some suggestions, we turn them back to their local public health agency to really begin to work on policy uh, as it relates to this. Um, trying to just skim through a couple of the other questions that we try to uh, answer. Some of, one of the questions that we got was, should I give these devices back to parents and guardians? Because I believe it's, it's pretty easy as a school to think, this is a lot of work, it's gonna cost us a lot of money. And honestly, we can just give this back to the parent and move, move on. But we know that that's actually not a best practice and not a way to address uh, the youth vaping uh, concerns um, uh, that a school might face. And so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to uh, the next slide here and talk a little bit about some of the work in uh, Boulder County. And so, um, so Boulder County, as I mentioned, really was the community that brought this to the state's attention. And we've been partnering pretty closely with them on, on the work. They provided a lot of feedback on some of the state documents. We have a state work group that they're a part of. Um, and so um, uh, they have this, uh, they have a disposal guide and a disposal kit that at the beginning of each school year, and along with a battery collection bin, gloves, hazardous waste labels, clear plastic syllable bags, a, a customer, a custom, excuse me, custom sticker with clear handling guidelines, and a vape bin that actually has a fill line on it already, which approximates this 2.2 pounds, right? So they offer this to any school, school that is interested in, uh, you know, what do we need to do now about collecting or when we confiscate uh, these materials. Um, the, the kit also has some things about uh, the hazardous nature, nature of these products, along with information on how to use the kits and to properly dispose of and, and um, uh, probably dispose of these products. So, you know, they, they give some more detail about, you know, what to do with uh, these products. And the nice thing about the uh, relationship that Boulder County has 
uh, directly with the schools, with the environmental services division at the school, and then also with their hazardous waste management facility is they have a strong partnership going. So the hazardous waste management facility, once these uh, buckets have been filled, will actually pick these up and take them and dispose of them in a way that is uh, appropriate uh, and under the regulation of the hazardous waste facility itself. So they, they, they take care to make sure that this waste is, uh, um, uh, you know, addressed uh, in a safe and uh, uh, in a safe manner. So, you know, one thing that uh, I, you know, often is asked about, you know, these kits and, you know, how do we, uh, you know, how do we afford to do this? It, um, and the idea is, you, you know, we're really trying to understand really what the cost for doing this is. Um, and so uh, recently, uh, Kira and I had a conversation with Boulder County about really what was your cost. And so in 2020, now, uh, mind you, that 2020, we spent most of the year as a remote, uh, in remote learning. Uh, so... But they and and then some, uh, uh, so they collected um, the total cost for the devices was one hundred nine hundred ninety two dollars for five pounds, or thirty eight dollars and forty one cents per pound, and for nicotine vape liquids it cost two hundred and ten dollars for four pounds or fifty two dollars per pound. So we're still working on collecting uh, 2021 uh, numbers on here. Um, so uh, usually on my first slide, I, I actually usually have a picture of Denver because we have some estimated cost models about what the total cost for the both the direct and indirect mitigation and abatement for uh, for all tobacco products, or actually, excuse me, for cigarettes are in Denver. And it's estimated that around four and a half million dollars annually uh, is what it takes to mitigate cigarette, uh, cigarette uh, tobacco uh, waste in Denver. So I uh, also wanna point out that, you know, Boulder not only is working with their schools, but they're also attempting to create this type of relationship with their uh, uh, vape shops and um, other tobacco shops that sell vapes. So they're really trying to collect all of this waste material as well. We'll see a little bit more about Boulder here on the next slide. Um, so this, uh, Kira showed this, uh, these materials, this is some of the uh, campaign materials. And what we know is that education is critical. And a lot of the time and effort went into meeting with education staff and administration at this school district to implement their disposal program. So it wasn't just the fact that they leaned heavily on their relationships with the schools, they had to, they had strong relationships, but they really had to uh, do a lot of education around uh, this, these products and, and to create this uh, process. And fortunately, they had a pretty strong relationship with their wellness coordinator. And the benefit that they described in having this relationship was as somebody in the school, they can help disseminate and coordinate uh, this this process, this program, uh, if you will. And so they had this relationship and, um, and they capitalized on it um, uh, pretty significantly. But, and this is one of the messages uh, uh, that Boulder County use. And, and messaging is important. Uh, and in Boulder's case, uh, they really chose to focus on the environment, which works well in this school district. But uh, we, our state work group has also really dove into sort of what type of messaging works across the state of Colorado and things like environmental justice and uh, Kira uh, pointed to social justice uh, in here as well. But 
the cost to schools, those are great messages, hurts the environment, and nicotine is a poison were all messages that actually worked uh, pretty well. But I want to point out this idea of the social justice issue uh, and reiterate what Kira said, which is, you know, that higher levels of tobacco product waste are found in low income communities where there's higher density, more disproportionate impact uh, of, of menthol cigarettes, specifically in African American and LGBT, Hispanic, and other communities that have been marginalized. And this includes environmental harms, uh, as uh, Kira uh, pointed out. So I want to talk about a few other communities that, and some work that they're doing. And so on the next slide, this is uh, Jefferson County. And Jefferson County put out a very similar uh, tips for safe disposal of e-cigarettes and e-liquids uh, and uh, distributes that through their school uh, tobacco program. They uh, use this as a lever to really talk with school administration about, you know, these are the things that we should and could and need to be doing to appropriately address the, the uh, confiscation of tobacco uh, of uh, specifically e-cigarettes uh, at the school level. Uh, Jefferson County on the next slide also has worked really hard uh, to you know, really put together potential policy solutions by coming up with a chart that really looks at uh, you know, boards of health, uh, schools, um, and other uh, in other sort of decision-making bodies and, and really looked at the types of policies that could be passed and what could be done uh, at uh, Jefferson County uh, for this. And so the, this is in your slide, so you'll be able to look a little more closely at this as well. Uh, next slide as well, uh, also as an important piece is to really understand the magnitude uh, of the problem itself. And so, uh, Jefferson County, Boulder County, both really had looked critically at not just how much of these products are being collected, but really started to look at the types of, of, of these products that were collected, whether it be a disposal or a mod or a, just the pod or, you know, uh, but also really the uh, brand of these products. And what we've done here is we've, we've created a drop down box and we're trying to collect every single type and brand that gets collected and sorted uh, through whatever facility, uh, uh, you know, one, because uh, this is, this is important information as you go to your schools, your districts, your boards uh, in your communities as well. So uh, the next couple of counties are pretty quick here. Uh, Mesa County is also doing some work really looking at their tobacco free school policy work and working directly with their environmental services uh, division uh, in a partnership and collaboration. Uh, Summit County, the next slide, is looking at uh, their tobacco policy and really using a youth-driven approach. And uh, right now, their focus is on these take-back events, utilizing incentives. But what we know is that that's really the most downstream approach that we can take. So we're, we're looking at how do we uh, 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 address that as well. And then the last slide here, and uh, I think we're just about at time here before we open it up to some questions, is that um, um, this is uh, this is the document that I was speaking about. So um, we have a, uh, the state has a, a broader tobacco, reducing youth tobacco and nicotine use in schools document, right, that we, we published. And it talks about things like promote quitting among students and staff, strengthen, communicate and enforce tobacco free school policies, provide reliable and accurate education. And then, and then the last section is about, you know, uh, both enforcement, but also in uh, confiscation and the proper disposal and nicotine. Uh, and so we'll, we'll publish this statewide uh, in January. Uh, so um, 
we have lots of work uh, around that still yet to do. So I think I'll stop there. Um, there's probably a ton of questions, things that I didn't hit, but uh, I think I've said all I'm gonna say at this point. All right. Well, Kara and Terry, uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, for sharing all of this information um, with us today. And yes, we definitely have um, a lot of questions in the Q and A box. So I will just start running them through, and I'll let you decide how um, how you want to answer them um, and who you want to take it. So the first one comes from Melanie, um, and she asks if there's anyone working on the fact that um, some organizations that work with pollution and with land are having conferences sponsored by grants from Philip Morris. She was at a conference, um, or excuse me, they were at a conference that had a lot of wonderful um, manipulatives that discussed um, cigarette and filter litter, and then they thanked Philip Morris for the funding. We can probably both speak to that, but I can um, go first. I mean, yeah, that that is a, that's a huge problem. Keep America Beautiful specifically, but also other organizations funded by the tobacco industry. And um, in terms of whether folks are working on it, I mean, I think Terry's um, comment towards the end there about kind of upstream versus downstream approaches, that's where the upstream approaches really matter because the tobacco industry does not want to affect consumption. They don't want to impact people using their products. They just want to kind of like band-aid over the problem and, you know, host cleanups or put out you know, bins for disposal, and that doesn't impact people's use of the products. It only impacts, you know, it's just sort of like this very insignificant um, kind of greenwashing of, of the issue. And so they have typically funded a lot of cleanups, been um, e even coming up with things like biodegradable filters, um, take back programs like you know, Jewel was at one point offering some sort of program where you could like sign up for a pack, a little envelope that they would send you to send back pods. Um, but yeah, the the I think focusing on kind of what strategies can can really impact um, people's understanding of this issue and impact consumption patterns. Um, those are the policies that we should be focusing on. I don't know if you want to add to that, Terry. <laughs> No, that was great, uh, Kira. I mean, I mean, we have to remember the tobacco. I mean, that. I mean, we're talking about a product that, when used appropriately, still kills half of all of its users, right? So, I mean, to to not to lose sight of that when we're talking about you know an industry that's manipulative and targeted and racketeers. I mean, we could just go on and on and allowing them to you know, get off this easy by, you know, throwing up some pretty banners or, you know, throwing a few dollars towards, you know, something that makes them look better is, you know, you know, what I want to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. And actually to that point too, like making sure that if you're partnering with groups, um, environmental organizations or any kind of, you know, youth organizations that those, those groups have policies that they will not accept funding from tobacco industry um, as well. Um, so the next question, um, Gregory asked, has a state or city attempted a deposit requirement? And what they specifically asked about was something like $5 deposits on batteries and $2 deposits on pods and require the industry to clean up the hazardous waste that they created. Um, so Terry and I were just talking about this the other day. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks who have thought, who've, who've been talking about this as a potential, you know, solution, at least to the e-cig problem. I think in the filtered cigarette space, the deposit system becomes a much larger um, complicated issue. But with e-cigs, I mean, you know, there are existing um, programs like in California, for example, where consumers are required to pay an additional fee for like a cell phone um, management program. In terms of a deposit that would actually come back to the consumer, um, I don't know of any jurisdictions that have actually pursued that kind of policy. I think in part because asking the retailer to like hang on to that money and then return it to the customer um, would, you know, A, be hard to enforce, B, encourage customers to come back into the, you know, tobacco retailer, which is potentially problematic from, um, you know, the standpoint of, of things like cessation. Um, but then also giving a, a, a retailer or even a manufacturer responsibility for the products is also problematic because we don't know, you know, to the earlier example of Juul, there's no real enforcement of like what is happening to those products. Um, 
are they just dumping them in a river? Who knows? Um, so there, there would have to be some sort of like robust enforcement of that kind of system, um, which could be, you know, paid for by the deposit. But then at the same time, I think that would require a much higher deposit, which we could debate whether or not that's actually a good thing because then it reduces um, consumption. So I think there's a lot of, there are people thinking about it. I just don't know of any jurisdictions that have um, gone so far as to either, either like, you know, to enact that kind of policy. And I know you have additional thoughts on that, Terry. <laughs> Uh, you know, the the deposit would have to be so high. I mean, we're talking, you know, five or six hundred dollars, right, in order to really sort of affect any kind of change in behavior around this. And then I was also thinking about this idea of like, you know, if uh, I'm collecting bottles and I can only take the bottles back to the vendor that I purchase them from, I mean, there's no really, there's no way to track that. And so I collect, you know, a thousand bottles and I take them to one store and they're just like, this isn't mine. You know, I mean, it creates this like really complex system that, uh, but yeah, I mean, we've definitely been thinking about how to, how to do something like that, uh, but just haven't come up with, you know, the easy, easy solution for that. So. Sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, Lee had asked, whose responsibility is it, um, which national organization, to notify schools of updates with regulations regarding how vape products are stored and discarded? Is there? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that that's kind of a tough question. I don't think that it necessarily falls on like any one entity to notify schools of updates. Um, you know, schools do have hazardous waste on hand already. So understanding the regulations that apply to them with respect to what kind of waste that they're collecting is kind of somewhat on the school. But then it's also on, you know, as Terry said, I think a lot of what happened in Boulder came as a result of a really good relationship with the folks at the hazmat um, or the at least the household hazardous waste site. So I think it's also kind of on the environmental, you know, regulators in the state who uh, also be helping, you know, at least that that's kind of my view on it. Um, and then also, you know, EPA has said that they are coming out with some sort of guidance document. Um, obviously, they, there's a little bit of like a um, cooperative relationship between states and the federal government um, in this space of, of regulation, um, which is why a lot of these states are coming out with their own guidance. But I think it would be helpful, for sure, to have EPA's insight on this. Um, but I think, I think it's kind of like both, it's like a both and answer in my mind. Yeah, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, hazardous waste. So working with uh, that group, like at a state level, and then I'm imagining even at a federal level that, you know, they're thinking about Superfund sites, you know, what, what happened, you know, where they're storing, chemical weapons, you know, that, or waste from nuclear reactors, you know, they're, <clears throat> the, you know, their mindset is that, you know, so when we start saying nicotine's an acute hazardous waste, you know, they're, they're not thinking I need to contact each school or each, you know, uh, whatever. So but I guess my point is, is that, you know, in 2016, when I became aware of that, I'm, I'm a tobacco control advocate specialist, you know, uh, rabid, you know, environmentalist here. I believe that once once I became aware of that, I, it became my responsibility to create this bridge, right? This bridge of information, right? And so when I train or educate those those around me about this, then I'm building sort of their capacity to be responsible again for sort of the safety and uh, proper disposal of of these products. And that would include sort of you know keeping up with these regulations and, and things that are changing. Nicotine as a hazardous, acute hazardous waste hasn't changed for a very long time. You know, the EPA just reaffirmed it. You know, there was, there was no real change uh, in that. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of responsibility and culpability here, but uh, I felt like my responsibility as a bridge uh, is, is critical in this. So. Oh, you're muted. I muted myself. Yep, because people were walking by. 
Um, Amanda had asked, how do the manufacturers of vape products store their products? Is there anything to learn from how they do it? Are they regulated or is it not overseen since so many products are manufactured overseas? Um, I can't really speak to the overseas aspect of it, but to the extent that they are accumulating over 2.2 pounds of acute hazardous waste on site, they are regulated, um, or it, even, even, even below that, um, they are, there is some degree of regulation that applies to them, but, um, the most significant level of, uh, regulation will occur once they accumulate that amount. And if they're a manufacturer, they probably already, they do that pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, these requirements do apply to them. Um, I mean, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna hopefully be complying with the requirements, um, that, you know, Terry alluded to and has in that guidance document. Um, there are some that have not though, and we, we, we do know of some examples, like there was a, I think it was Enjoy, um, a, a bunch of Enjoy products in Indiana were left in a warehouse um, and they got stopped with a really significant uh, fine for not storing, for holding things too long and not storing them properly. And so there are examples where, you know, people have not complied with, um, with these requirements and then they get pretty hefty fines um, slapped on them. Yeah. I think also we should remember that these are actually still illegal products. I mean, except for the, the fact that, you know, the FDA has uh, authorized a few products to be on the market, right? So, uh, so there's the illegal nature of, of them. And then, and then, you know, our, our experience here in Colorado is that it goes vastly under regulated, nor, you know, I mean, only a few times where I've pushed have our hazardous waste regulators, our inspectors gone out and done any kind of, and, and they, don't, they don't do it as a regulator. They do it as these courtesy type, you know, you need to make sure you're storing this properly. Uh, but um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say about that. Okay. Um, so Victoria had asked, what instructions are provided and who is responsible for removing batteries from ENDS products? Removing batteries from devices is potentially hazardous and can cause injury. Um, do you have thoughts on that, Terry? Um, so in our guidance, we, we say pretty explicitly, do not disassemble. Uh, don't take them apart. Don't do anything like that. That actually should be uh, done at a facility where they are prepared to, to you know, um, have, have protective gear. Uh, and, um, you know, you just don't know what you're, you, you know, you don't know what the, um, what the product might do in and of itself. But, uh, and then sort of really trying to you know, break into those things to remove the battery. I mean, just our guidance is always don't mess with it. Don't take it apart. Don't, you know, increase the likelihood that it'll leak nicotine or the battery could explode or just give it to the professionals. Fair enough. Um, so somebody had asked, what would you say is the best practice for districts to use test strips to test the contents of confiscated vaping devices to discern if the liquid is nicotine or THC. I'm, I'm going to say that that's again you're you're altering a device that potentially is dangerous. So, I mean, I'm not sure that that. Uh, you know, our guidance is also everything is hazardous waste. If you collect it, if you confiscate it. And the idea is that really, you know, what you're, you know, what we're looking to do in a graduated penalties for youth is really, you know, create some kind of avenue for cessation or counseling or something of that nature. And rather than sort of creating this punitive approach to, uh, to the confiscation uh, of these products. Sometimes it has to happen, but I would not recommend taking these items apart to understand what's in it. Okay. Um, Ron said, sounds like you were saying, keep it simple. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Philip had asked, does Minnesota have a guidance document for proper disposal in general community or in the school? 
Um, I if that there is a guidance document that came out of Minnesota, um, I will say just speaking personally, I'm not sure. I think different states can kind of, uh, how do I say this? But um, I, 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 I really like Colorado and the example that Carrie, that Terry shared. Um, I, you know, I think that some of this is, is kind of like a new area and that different regulators seem to be taking different approaches to things. Um, so I believe that there is one out there, um, but uh, yeah, you might, you might notice some differences from state to state. When we built ours, we, we were inspired by Minnesota, but we, we looked at it maybe a little bit differently. Good. Okay, great. Um, Lisa asks, are the environmental impacts similar for ends with synthetic nicotine? Um, as I was talking, I knew someone was going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that is something that um, we, this is just like such a new area that we need to, to research and, and understand more. I mean, certainly, you know, if it's truly non-tobacco derived nicotine, we're going to have to understand you know, especially upstream production impacts are going to be different. What does that look like? Um, I am really interested in figuring out more about that, but I don't, my, you know, they, the, the, they necessarily will be different, at least from, from kind of the upstream impacts. But, you know, as these products are being manufactured, of course, there are still all those industrial pollutants, air emissions, um, wastewater, you know, all, all of that stuff. And then the waste impacts are, are going to be um, similar. So uh, some of it's very different and some of it's going to be the same probably an unsatisfying answer. <laughs> That's all I can give at this point. Okay, uh, Lee had asked, do you have examples of best practices for transporting the products from schools to disposal units and examples of appropriate vape collection containers? Yeah, um, in one of the slides, uh, there is an example of the disposal kits that um, Boulder County uses. And um, as far as a protocol for how and who picks up the uh, products, it really is this uh, relationship with the hazardous waste unit uh, management uh, facility there in Boulder County. And they have a way that they transport uh, these, these products to uh, to their facility so that you know they have a they have an internal sort of process uh, that's regulated as a as as a hazardous waste so I think some of that uh, should have made it into your um, uh, into the slide slides that um, uh, I think they'll be shared out uh, with you guys so uh, and you know of course if there's more detail that's needed we can we can sit down and have a conversation I can get you in touch with Boulder County and you know talk through some of the details that they know more specifically. Got it. Um, Amanda had asked what about National Drug Take Back Day? They currently accept vape juices and devices once batteries are removed. This addresses the fact that THC and other drugs may be in the device. Is this still too dangerous of an approach due to the e-juices? Are you, are, are you speaking about the DEA's drug take back? Uh, yeah, I would assume so. National Drug Take Back Day. So um, I tried to partner with the DEA on, on this process. And they're, you know, one, they certainly only want to limit it to like individuals actually taking you know, like what could have been personal use devices back. So I said, because I, I propose, why don't we have schools who, you know, have collected these devices, bring them to you. And they were not excited about that proposal at all. Um, how they store and collect that, I don't have a really good idea about that. Um, Kira, do you know if there's some details on how they, how they do that? Um. I don't specifically, I mean, I've, I've heard this anecdotally that, you know, they don't really inspect what they're getting. So even though the batteries are supposed to be removed, I don't get the sense that they actually like really check that the batteries are supposed to be removed. So 
Um, I don't know, you know, what happens kind of after the fact, but, um, you know, in theory, it's an option, but I just, you know, they don't, those take back days don't occur. Someone might know better than I do, but I think it's like twice a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know much about, um, the practicality of that. Okay. Um, so Ron had asked, uh, is the total of 2.2 pounds a total of all hazardous waste or is it 2.2 pounds for each type of hazardous waste? So the 2.2 pounds actually refer, is, the, is the acute hazardous waste um, restriction that, that we talked about that like nicotine falls specifically within this really special category. Um, other types of hazardous waste, um, I think it's, is it a hundred kilograms, Terry? Do you know? I'm not remembering now. Oh, off the top of my head. Okay, it's 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 a larger amount, but um, but it it would count with. So the 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 two the two point two pounds is the the threshold at which a uh, school would become a large quantity generator. But you would add um whatever other hazardous wastes the school has on hand. So if it's paints or solvents or all that. Um, you know, it there there's a different threshold, but you would have to add in like this special category of waste as you're kind of counting it all together. Yeah, okay. so th that's why Boulder instead of really saying because we work we operate off of the 2.2 pounds of acute hazardous waste, right? So we say here's the fill line, right? And the way that they've measured that fill line is they've just taken every single device. They don't separate it. It includes the batteries, the electronics, the plastics, the nicotine residual, or if it's an actual liquid. And then they just fill that bucket up to that fill line and it weighs 2.2 pounds. So they ensure that they don't cross that threshold that um, Kira's talking about. They say, you know, uh, yeah, they just, that's how they manage keeping themselves underneath the, the large quantity generator designation. Got it. Um, Teresa had asked about information you can share if you've worked with school resource offices or sheriff's offices. Um, they've had some issues when they've been working within their school district about um, the school resource offices saying, I'm, I'm assuming that they're talking about vape disposal boxes, but that that wasn't uh, possible for their school resource officers. Hmm. Um, I, I guess I'm not quite sure why they were told that that wasn't possible. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer without specific details about why why the school resource office was. Yeah, was yeah, it seems like there would be, there needs to be more information about why the SROs were like pushing back on them. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I think about that for just a second though, this, you know, if I have a collection site, a bucket, just, you know, and I'm collecting, uh, you, you know, these devices, one, they should be monitored. They need to be, they need to be, they need to set in an area that has enough space around them that, uh, you know, following sort of this hazardous waste guidelines, you know, and so, you know, maybe this idea that the SRO says, you know, we, we don't have the resources or capacity to really sort of monitor up, you know, different disposal sites around the school, you know, uh, that that might play into the reason why the SRO said, no, we can't do that. No, it's not possible. Okay, um, I'm just reading through the last couple of questions and making sure that they haven't been uh, answered in some specific way already. Um, Ananda had asked, how successful has Colorado been in proper disposal while most schools and communities are still mostly reeling from youth use? I mean, I'm not sure how to define success at this point. Um, I think we're still sort of learning what that might look like. Mm -hmm. um, we've not stopped youth use for sure. Uh, you know, young people are still using, schools are still uh, confiscating, right? But what we're trying to do is establish this system by which, you know, we, we think of the, 
the youth as, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the best interest of the youth, and then also what is in the best interest of the environment. So to try to marry that uh, in the best possible way. Uh, the other idea is that schools can't do it all, right? We have to not just address the school issue of these vape devices. We have to look into our communities. I mean, in the beginning, my very first slide, I, I mean, I said that, you know, we're talking about neighborhood playgrounds, parks, lining our streets. I mean, this is not just a school problem. This is a community problem. Uh, and there are additional solutions to that uh, via policy, the most upstream kind of approaches. So um, yeah, I, I, not, I'm not sure how to define success just yet. Success is ever growing. It's always a target. <laughs> Kara, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? Um, I mean, I just totally echo what Terry just said. And then I also think just kind of like, as we're talking about things like confiscation, just reminding, um, I think probably most people are on the same page, but, but we don't want to talk about, you know, punitive uh, measures that are taken as these things are being confiscated. Like we really want to think about cessation support. We want to think about, um, you know, making sure that, that kids are, that are, that are using these products and then they get confiscated that, that there isn't, um, that, you know, suspension is not on the table, that we're talking about alternative measures to really provide, um, you know, restorative support to, to these kids. Um, mm -hmm. So just want to, yeah, make, <laughs> like, make that, that plug that I'm sure folks are um, largely on the same page about, so. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a great point. I would take that a step further and say, if we think about that at, at the school community, we should also think about that at the community level, right? And remove any type of minor in possession, pup laws, purchase, use, or possession. Because what we know is that, you know, uh, you, you know, the predatory approach of tobacco, you know, is actually preying on preying on young people, you know. So let's let's address the addictive nature, let's address their approach uh, and not punish young people. Yeah. Um, so we'll do one last question. Um, and Kathy had asked, does the environmental harm message resonate with youth? I have definitely found that it has, for sure. I mean, just even like, you know, I don't, well, Terry, you're a youth. You work, you work with youth more than I do, so maybe you should speak to that. But for, in, in my short answer, it's like, yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you, you're, I, I think so as well. Uh, and the Truth Initiative, I, Kira, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think they've been putting out a few items mm -hmm. on hazardous waste and they are finding that the environmental message does resonate with young people you know, around this issue. So uh, they, they've got a couple of really nice sort of graphic uh, and data centered uh, uh, pieces that uh, people can Google and really just get Great. Well, Kira and Terry, thank you again so much um, for taking the time to speak with our audience today and for sharing your information. Um, I have put a couple of times in the um, in the chat box, but I'll do it one last time, the evaluation for today's webinar. Um, so please um, take some time, complete the evaluation, let us know what you thought about the webinar. And if you're looking for your letter of participation for um, your credit hours for, um, for this webinar, you'll be able to download that after you complete it. If you have any other questions about today's um, webinar, you can go ahead and um, send Gia an email. Their email address is there on the screen and they can get you the information. And um, you know, just a reminder that we were recording this. These resources will be posted on our website in the next few days, along with the slides and this recording. So you can go back, you can watch um, later, you can share with your coworkers. Workers, um, but you'll also be able to access all of those um, links and other resources that Kira and Terry mentioned in their webinar today. Um, and again, just thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday wherever you are.